Jordan. But, but um, I'm going to spend more time talking about things that didn't go very well in the past. Um, I've um, been an entrepreneur since I was 16, so there's plenty to talk about. Um, the, um, the, this is the number of projects or companies that I've founded or been involved with. And these are the sectors that they, they cover. And you can see that uh, we've done quite a bit. Um, maybe not a good thing to do. I uh, thought it might be one of the bits of advice, pick the one thing. Um, but uh, you know, from magazines to record labels to renewable energy company to a computer games company to an online accounting software company to a travel business. Um, so it's pretty broad. I mean, it's part of the fun. Uh, part of the fun of being an entrepreneur is that you can you can go across and see an opportunity and dive into it. Uh, it inevitably leads to more mistakes. If you do something new, you're bound to make more mistakes because that's part of the learning process. So. Uh, that's why I've got plenty to talk about today, and I'll try, try and keep it in time. Um, the, just briefly, the businesses are in the good category. I'm not going to talk about all of those ones in the list, but in the good category, there's probably three. Um, I'm going to spend the least amount of time talking about them. Um, in the bad category, there's two. Um, sort of half results, not really what I wanted, but not too bad, not a complete waste of time. And in the bad, in the ugly, Sorry, the ugly. Um, two definite candidates for the ugly category. Um, and I, uh, once I go through to it, I think you'll pretty, pretty clearly see why. Um, to try and help kind of give us a structure, I've been reading a book recently by Peter Thiel, uh, put zero to one. Um, good read if anyone hasn't actually read it yet. Um, he was the, if anyone doesn't know about him, he was the co-founder of PayPal and the first outside investor in Facebook. Uh, very, very smart guy. He usually says things in quite an interesting way as well. Um, he, um, he wrote a book, and in his book he asked seven questions. Um, and I'm going to kind of use these questions to score the businesses that I used to, I used to run and, and the ones I'm currently running um, as a kind of device to see how they, how they score. Um, and what it turns out is that the ones that did badly obviously didn't answer a lot of these questions well enough. Um, and if you basically, if you, of the seven questions, if you can answer five or six well, your business is probably going to be okay. If you can answer all seven with a yes, you're probably going to make, a, make, make a, have good success and make a good money. Um, and if you're down in the twos and threes, you're probably in big trouble. And you've, you'll find your business is coming up into lots of bad luck. That's kind of a euphemism for, for not quite a good business. Um, so let's look at the bad first. So this is sort of medium results. Um, there was a lot of learning experiences through them. Um, Frontier Media was the first company, uh, the second company was Expense Manager. Frontier Media was the first company I started when I left university. Um, lots of uh, pain involved in that one. Um, and Expense Manager was something more recent, there was a spin out of another business which I'll talk about. Um, to do the scoring mechanism, I kind of won't labor the scoring, but you can, Frontier Media comes at about 5.5, and that feels about right. Um, the main problem is being here that uh, Frontier Media, let me explain what it is first. Frontier Media was an interactive telephony service provider. So that's basically like if you called, uh, spoken to a computer on the phone and you could press buttons, that's the same piece of kit. And in 1994 and 1995, it was relatively new. Um, and what I chose to do something with music using that equipment, um, enabling people to listen to music before they bought the music. In fact, I ditched the idea of selling the music and I just did the listening. Um, in fact, that wasn't a brilliant idea either because the record labels didn't want to give us permission, didn't want to give me permission to use the, the IP in that way, use the music in that way. Uh, and that's probably the, the timing question. Uh, the time was kind of okay from a tech point of view, but bad from a, from a licensing point of view. And if you want to launch a business and you need permission from someone to launch your business, you need to have a plan B for to make money. You need to have a plan B to generate some revenues. Otherwise, you're completely stuck. And that's what happened to me. I mean, we sort of used the time to keep developing the software, to make it to function uh, in an interesting way. Um, but for about two years, literally, I was bouncing around going from the record labels to the less of the agencies and back again. And it wasn't surprising to learn that they were just prevaricating, they could not make a decision, and they were so afraid of their IP being stolen that they didn't issue any licenses what happened in the end is the individual record companies gave me permission, but some of them were sensible and some of them perceived it was not a threat, but other ones didn't, and it was a fudge. 
So I basically got verbal approval. I started the business anyway. Um, we had something, you know, almost the field of the contract. I put money to the side, which was the 15% of revenues, which was the royalty fee. Um, and, and we launched the business and got a, a lot of music and um, magazine and newspaper clients in the UK. Significant ones like The Sun sells 4 million copies every day, Smash It magazine was huge then, uh, Sunday Times, etc. The Guardian. So we had, a, we had a good market position in terms of monopoly because we only provided a very, very niche service. And actually, when we were trading, fully trading, we were very profitable. So it wasn't a bad business, it just had a few things about practices about it which was, which was difficult. I would say. Um, what was the big mistake for that business? It was missing the opportunity to do premium rate ringtones. And I guess, again, that probably doesn't make much sense to you, but in the days gone by, Nokia's didn't come with, they came with a very small set of ringtones, and you had to buy additional ringtones. And then you were enabled, enabled to do that using the same kit that we had, we could have offered that service, and obviously we had excellent distribution in terms through, through the magazines and newspapers that we worked with. And basically, I just missed that. You know, it was a very profitable business. Came out of nowhere. A lot of people made made a ton of money in that sector, and we were. I was just too focused on on what we were particularly doing at that time. And I think that's probably the lesson there is probably if you have a business partner, that's the sort of thing that the business partner can help you do and spot other opportunities. If you, I didn't have a business partner then, and you know, then you just have one brain. You know, you're, you're focused on one problem, solving one problem. If you have a partner, sometimes that's where the two brains really, really comes in because they can say, hey, what about this? Um, and I think that's probably the, the big learning lesson from, from that business. Um, what was the result? Um, we, I ran it for about five years, uh, made some decent profits in the end, um, but eventually it sort of got killed by the internet. We could see that happening. Um, and it didn't really matter too much. We paid back, we paid back all the software development costs, and in the end I moved on to other things, which I'll touch on in a minute. Expense magic was relatively recent. Um, my wife said, if you continue to talk to developers about where to put a button on an app about expenses, I'm going to leave you. So <laughs> that was one of the reasons I stopped doing it. Um, the other one is I moved to Hong Kong. But more importantly, um, it, was, it, it was not brilliant business. It doesn't score very highly um, uh, on this kind of analysis. Um, and for pretty good reasons, I think, too. Um, we, Spence Magic was, a, was it's an app. It's still functioning. Um, where you take a picture of an expense receipt, it pops up on the screen in India, they read the data off and they put it in and they get to pay back to your phone. And the reason we wanted to do that, the reason I thought it was a relatively neat solution for, for the expense capture problem is that expenses are coming kind of all sorts of different bits of paper, they can be handwritten, the data can be anywhere on the good page. It's actually something that computers are very, very bad at doing. Um, OCR just cannot do it. Um, so, it was interesting when I was reading Peter Thiel's book that he talks about PayPal um, and when uh, PayPal was launched, starting in the late 90s and early 2000s, they had a huge fraud problem. And they invested a lot of money developing software to try and tackle that problem, and that didn't really work. And what they discovered was the best solution was a hybrid. It was the software would flag up transactions that looked fraudulent, and then a human team would look through them because there was just something about the way they needed to anal analyze it the humans were better at it. And that's how they got on top of their, their fraud problem with PayPal. Um, another interesting anecdote about PayPal is that it was formed out of two companies. One was X.com and the other one was PayPal. And X.com was founded by Elon Musk and PayPal was founded by Peter Thiel. And those guys, they could see in 1999, they could see that they were matching each other function for function, basically. And they were going to kill each other. And they literally went for lunch, two entrepreneurs, smart guys, and they decided to combine their businesses. And that's one of the reasons why they survived. So it's kind of interesting, that type of anecdote as well. Um, what was the result with, um, with uh, so what was the other problems with Expense Magic? The distribution problem, I mean, anyone who's doing apps will know getting out of the crowd, getting traction is very, very difficult in the world of apps. Um, you know, there was no network effect. You're not really going to tell your friends about an expense app. You know, we tried some sort of Tricks. We tried to give people, you know, presents, surprises if they told their friends and so on. And if they were the biggest expense spencer, you know, they would they would come out on the charts and things like that. Competitiveness, um, all of that didn't really work. Um, we did manage to crack the kind of financial model, which was to do an all-you-can-eat package. So we, with the pricing and how to work out the business model, we did sort of get make some progress on. 
And all you can eat was definitely the right way to go. That means you can just buy one price so you can send as many expenses through as possible. So from a revenue point of view, we were able to persuade another company that yes, there was potential. We'd done the hard work of kind of proving it. And you know, we, we actually sold it to another company for shares. So it was a sort of okay exit. No, no, we'll see that business is still doing very well. And those shares maybe were something in the future, but it wasn't certainly a cash exit. Um, and it also enabled me to move to Hong Kong and start something new, which was good. And I kept my wife. Um, the, the real meat and potatoes of this talk is the, is the ugly part, is the ugly stories. Um, and here there are two companies. One, one looks really obvious now that, uh, you know, why, why do an online retailer? But in 1999, I wasn't the only one starting an online retailer. A lot of people did, a lot of people got funding. Amazon got, obviously, started in about 96, 97, something like that. They got huge funding, um, made a lot of mistakes, but managed to survive. Um, and Workology, which was an uh, online cloud-based, really. It's cloud-based accounting platform for freelancers and SMEs in the UK because we felt, I felt there was an opportunity to provide a service to, to that sector where they have a real pain around keeping their accounts up to date. Um, the self-employed people accounts don't go together very well, especially when they're freelancing. Um, so how did they score? Uh, this is really no surprise that they came out scoring so badly when you look back on it. Um, you know, engineering, you know, you're developing a website. Uh, now it's obviously super easy. Then you had to code, hard code everything, but it was doable. But we couldn't really be that different. What we did do with on the website was try to be quite innovative. We did a lot of video clips, um, video interviews, which which were sort of adding to the content side of the, of the retail site, um, and that took us down quite an interesting avenue, but didn't particularly lead to to increase sales. Um, timing, uh, bad timing, probably in, again in retrospect because a lot of people were piling into the same business um, and a lot of them were better, much better funded than we were. I mean even in the UK there was a local competitor called Gameplay.com. They raised 400 million in the, in the dot com boom and they worked with that in two years and were sold for a pound. So it, it maybe wasn't that surprising that we really did manage to survive in that, in that, uh, in that, in that environment. Um, the, you know, uh, the conclusion is that we just fail to escape competition. You know, competition is something to be avoided. Um, you want to be so different or moving so fast that you can stay ahead of competition or you're just like Apple, you're really way out ahead in terms of design and that gives you some defendability. But that sort of statement of trying to avoid competition or to escape the, the threat of competition, competition kills people, kills businesses. And it's not a, not a good idea to go into one where it's incredibly crowded. I'll come back to the hive on your comment at the beginning um, about how to try and do that. Um, what was the result with um, gameswire.com? We liquidated it at the end. You know, we just couldn't trade our way out of a bad situation. Uh, our turnover, turnover was increasing to about two million pounds, but really not enough to generate significant profits. And as you know, online retail, Amazon spent the first five or six years of its life losing money and still dips in and out, even this quarter, it's just lost, lost again, quite a big proportion. Um, quite a surprise on the negative about its losses. So it's a tough business, and the, the only, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, a, lot of, a lot of corpses on that particular trail. Um, Workology was sort of a better idea uh, in principle. Um, it was, what was Workology? Uh, it, as I said, it um, allowed people to do invoicing and keep their expenses on a cloud-based solution. Um, but what was bad about it was really the people thing. Um, here, I got involved with Workology because I, it was brought to me uh, as an investor. I'd made a bit of money out of Jagex, and I was sort of looking for companies to invest in. And two young guys, two young entrepreneurs, came to me with Workology and had an idea, you know, which I felt could have some legs. Now, basically, I was a little bit lazy about my due diligence, and I invested in the business and then later discovered quite quickly that those two guys weren't particularly good entrepreneurs. You know, one, one worked at the BBC before, a very nice guy, very bright, but um, the combination of the two wasn't really what the company needed. So one left quite quickly, um, and the other one, after working with him for about three months, I had to ease out of the business in a polite way. Um, and he ended up becoming a Tory MP in, English, in England, which tells you something about the quality of the politicians. 
in England. Um, the, you know, what was, what was potential about it was that if you become a platform, we felt that by specializing a particular group of people, that would actually be an opportunity and therefore we could become a de facto standard for that group and then we could expand from there. And there is a company called Free Agent in the UK which is doing exactly that. So they've proved that you can do it well. Um, Zero is obviously doing tremendously well at the, at the coming at this from a slightly different angle. Um, there is an opportunity in that business, we just couldn't get it right. And what happened was we basically spent too much money developing and didn't leave any money for marketing. And the marketing that we were doing was expensive. We had to visit people, persuade them. There's a lot of inertia about where you do your accounts. Um, you know, you, if you got used to doing it one way, it's quite difficult to be persuaded to do it in another way, unless someone pays you to do it in a different way, or you know, it's very, very persuasive. So we had, we had a tiny sales team going out and visiting people, and you know, we could persuade them, and they would sign up, but it was, that was very slow, very hard work, and quite expensive. Um, and in the end of it, we ran out of money and ran out of energy, really, to, to, to see that happen. Um, but out of it, we pulled expense magic, which I've already touched on. But that was the thing we sort of thought was worth saving, and we liquidated Workology. Um, the backstory to Workology was that it actually wasn't a brand new company. It was a company that had previously existed under these two guys, but in doing a slightly different business, and they burned through cash previously. So I really should have, that's really my big mistake, I really should have looked deeper ask much harder questions of them before investing. Um, and I think that's about the purity. I'm often a, a good business is where the team is right at the beginning, the idea is right, it's a clean idea, everyone knows exactly what they're going for. And in this case, it really wasn't. It was sort of bastard child of, of previous previous and commercial activities. Do you know what I mean? And even if you tried to then extract a good idea, it, just, it, wasn't, it wasn't a good way to go. Um, so the, the scores for this were one out of seven. I mean, that, that really tells, tells, tells the story. Um, really, really wasn't a good thing to get involved with. Um, what was the investment? It was in that round that I was involved in, it was 400,000 sterling invested and raised, and 200 of that was mine. So it wasn't the cheap mistake, but it wasn't crazy expensive, but still, nevertheless, two years burnt and no result to speak of at all. Just to cheer everyone up a little bit, as I know you've been hearing a lot of bad news stories, um, th this afternoon. Um, these are the three businesses which are I'm still a shareholder of um, and still involved with and, and still very passionate about. Um, Dawn Energy, The Hive, and Jagex. What's Dawn Energy? Dawn Energy is a very tiny wind developer and wind farm developer in Scotland. Uh, the Hive is a co-working space that some of you may know um, and, and, and have visited. And, Dawn en and um, Jagex is a computer games company, which is really the biggest part of my career. It's the longest, it was an eight year, eight year part of my career, from 2001 to 2008-9, um, and also was the most financially rewarding by, by far. The, just touching, going, touching on Dawn Energy, why does it score highly, and what does it score badly on? So the first question on engineering, because it's a wind farm developer, it, we buy in the hardware, you know, we're just trying to make the right choice of turbine. Uh, the timing question is, is more difficult because planning permission in England is getting, in Scotland, is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. So uh, there's a sort of backlash against renewables in England slightly. And also there's very difficult to get onto the grid in England. So there's a couple of sort of structural problems which are, which are affecting our business. Um, we've managed to find a way through that. Um, it took a long while to, to sort of get that business to the point of having good prospects, um, because planning permission takes so long. Um, but I stuck with it, you know, I thought, I thought there was potential. I changed the guy that was running it. The new guy is much more entrepreneurial. We shrank the team back to now literally just one, and then he's actually had a planning success this year, and we're gonna build one next year, so that'll be two turbines up and running. It's not a huge business, but it's profitable, and it has, it, it's, been, uh, it's got still further potential to go. And we found a niche, which is golf clubs in England. So, we were putting the turbines onto golf clubs because they can get all their members to sign the uh, support papers, which is very helpful when it comes to planning. Um, the Hive, as you know, some of you may know, we started about two and a half years ago, three years ago. Um, at that time, there was about three or four co-working spaces in, in Hong Kong. Uh, there are now, uh, yeah, over 30 at least, uh, and seems to be more popping up all the time. I don't see that as a bad thing. I, I think that co-working, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs are trying to fill niches. 
Uh, they're trying to fill locations which don't have a co-working space. I think that's all you know, very healthy, and I think that um, some will survive, and hopefully will definitely be one of them, uh, and some may not, you know, depending on, particularly on the location that they choose um, and the, the crowd that they're trying to go after. Um, the, you know, now co-working is just like the norm for, for many people. Um, we, we see a tremendous mega trend behind people working in smaller and smaller teams, working independently, working in a, in a nomadic way as well. We think that mega trend has is, is, is got many, many years still to run. You know, as, as corporations sort of maybe become less attractive, but also in certain economic sectors, it's now possible to, to create a business which previously wasn't possible, but because of interconnectivity between different skill sets, you can now actually operate as a business, whereas previously you, you had to be in a, in a larger entity. So there's, there's a huge mega trend underpinning co-working, and, and we see that, I see that as the opportunity to, to do co-working spaces of the style that we are, we're doing in Singapore and Tokyo and Taipei and, and lots of other cities in Asia. We, I was in Singapore last week, and even though it's a mature economy, mature market, you would have thought it, they had co-working well covered, um, and we still definitely see an opportunity for us. Um, what's interesting there is there's so much free space for startups. Um, and, and you know, zombie startups and that whole other issue which someone has talked about today already, I think. Um, so Jagex, this is the, this is the, you know, this is the, this was the out of the park success. Um, why was it successful? I think because, you know, this score is an honest score. I think it's still, that if I asked those questions in 2001 when I was debating with Andrew about joining with him, um, it would have, it would have got these scores then. Um, there was, uh, you, Andrew developed fantastic software um, that enabled the game to be developed, to, delivered in the browser, uh, which no one had done before. Uh, MMOs were popular, but there was no MMO for, for kids. The, when you, when you, when you, if you have a hit game and all your friends are talking about it, you tend to play that game. So it has a huge network effect in terms of um, market position. The people were good. There was only three of us at the beginning, me, Andrew, and his brother. And that was a great team. Andrew's bro Andrew did software and really, really all of the tech. His brother did the games design, and I did the business side. Um, and in fact, funnily enough, the very first person we recruited was a customer service person. Because we, as soon as we had customers, we had to start looking after them. Um, and in, in today's terms, it's kind of hard to realize that people were not paying any attention to casual games then. It was all about hardcore gamers. Um, now you've seen Supercell, Rovio, all of these games, you know, make billions out of casual games, but then that just wasn't the done thing. So we really took, and we got, you know, we got laughed at, basically, because the game Jagex, the game RuneScape, which Andrew had developed in 2001, it looked terrible. You know, it looked scratchy. The actual characters were only 2D. The world was 3D, but the characters were 2D. And it looked pretty terrible, but those, the kids that played it, and they eventually played it in their millions, didn't mind. So, you know, you had to just stick to the guns and, and, and go into it and we, we could see an opportunity there. And we were, you know, it was, it was a very pure play from the beginning. Um, distribution was online. That was, that was obviously the, one of the key attributes of the, of the business. And durable, is it durable? Yes, they've just announced, they've just released RuneScape 3 and they still have players counting in the millions and they're making very, very decent profits. Um, was it a secret? No, it wasn't the secret was, was doing as I said, touched on before, doing games for a sector which everyone else had ignored. So what's the summary? Uh, ask yourself the right questions at the beginning. Um, and even better than that, get someone you, you admire to ask the questions, because you're probably going to be much more honest to him or her than you would be to yourself. Um, the, some quotes which I think um, are quite fun, a couple from Churchill, obviously it's all about Failing, um, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts. Um, he probably said that in 1939-40. Um, a great one by Gary Player, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. That's actually paraphrasing Thomas, Thomas Jefferson. Um, and then one which I thought was really suitable for Hong Kong is by Bruce Lee. Uh, mistakes are always forgivable if one has the courage to admit them. Um, if anyone has any questions about some of the mistakes I've made, and I'm very happy to, to admit to them and answer those questions. This is just some light reading. Um, I'm happy to t tell anyone these books, which I, I'm reading either recently or I read at particular times of my career because they were very, very helpful. 
Um, I think a couple of good points about this reading list is that when Andrew and I found ourselves with a company of 100 people after a year, we'd never managed a company before. So I had to go out and read books about how to manage a company and manage people. I didn't go to do an MBA, just read up, and then we, we executed that. We went up to 440 people. So, you know, MBAs, I think, are, are worth less than a good book, in my opinion. Um, and excuse anyone who's doing an MBA at the moment. Um, but anyway, that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I look forward to answering any questions if you have them. It is amazing that you have in your portfolio you have the different kind of uh, company you are supporting. But I want to know is how you support those company to say go to the next round because you are not specified in specific domain. Sorry, sorry, say again. Is that financially or do yeah, you mean financially or how you bring that to the uh, to the second round investor or how to help them to grow bigger? So. Most of those businesses that I've talked about have been relatively small tickets, if you know what I mean, in terms of investment. Um, Dawn Energy is by far the biggest in terms of cash because each turbine costs a million sterling. But we can get debt financing for that. So we just look at each individual business and find out what financing it needs to expand. And sometimes it's something that I can fund or else we go to outside investors. So initially we start small and then as a business grows, we look to see when, when the right time is to bring outside investors in. Or debt. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is very simple. Is, uh, we're mentioning like uh, two guys who are uh, collaborating with like as a, we're not good entrepreneur. So my question is, what is the good entrepreneur? Um, I think, you know, good often, you know, certainly people talk about this, and there's lots of books about it, but somebody just lives and breathes it, you know, and, and, and absolutely is enthused by what they're doing. Um, literally lives and breathes it, you know, when you wake up in the morning, it's the first thing they think about, it's the last thing they think about before they go to sleep. Uh, and someone who's got clear ambitions, you know, they, they know where they want to go, they set themselves goals, uh, six month, five year, and they, they really have that tendency to, to go for them and, and, and achieve them. So goals driven is, is, is a key factor. Um, somebody, who, somebody listens, somebody looks and observes what's going on around them, doesn't get too fixated on, on their own idea, and somebody who has, you know, is able to ask questions of, of what they're doing. Um, I think when people make mistakes is when they just pile on ahead without, they just pile on ahead blindly. Uh, they think that just drive is everything, which actually I think sometimes you need the other things as well. Yeah. So, is there one? Question, thank you very much. You get a word. <laughs> Hello, Hello. Thank you for um, When you're running so many businesses at the same time, how do you find the people um, that run your businesses? For example, the guy that runs your turbines. Um, and can you give us some advice of you know what to look for in the whole hiring process? Yeah, I mean that's I think that's particularly where lessons have been learned. I think you know you if you do run multiple businesses and as an entrepreneur you, you try one that you do not get to that stage. You know, that's a sort of let's say more mature entrepreneur where you, you know you're out of your twenties. You're not just doing one thing. You may be doing two or three things, and that's you know Musk does very incredibly successfully. And, Richard Branson and others. So, so yes, you do need to find people to run those businesses. And I'm very lucky to have some excellent stuff um, and some excellent people on the team. Who, and you know, you what do you look for? Um, so the, you asked a particular question about Wasim Hussein, who's um, running Dawn Energy in Scotland. He, how you find like a, a manager for the high for the for the. Um, you know, what would you use in your criteria in terms of finding the right people for those positions? So the, 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 preferred method, the, the preferred method, which I think works out best, the worst method is to use an outside recruitment or a headhunter and to bring them in. The best method is, either, is best preferably to bring them up from inside. 
So just support people who've got talent, support people who've got ambition, and start giving them more and more responsibility until they can sort of take over either one part of it or take over the whole group or take over elements of it. Um, the hardest thing is when you don't have, I and mean, that's as the company grows, that's one of the advantages. You've got staff coming in and you're able to sort of allow people to have progression and everyone grows and everyone gets more responsibilities. So that's why a growing business is, is much easier. Um, a company which is such a, so small as Dawn Energy, that's much more difficult. And that was a bit of a lucky find. You know, he, he's based in Glasgow, but we usually ended up with him and he's turned out to do a fantastic job. So it's a bit of both. See, all right. Uh, thank you. And do you have a bit of a more particular formula of say, let's say, you give an equity after X amount of time? I think that, I, I, funny enough, I was having a very interesting chat with someone who runs Fortnum and Mason in London last night. And he, he's the CEO, and he, um, before that, he ran Selfridges, which is a big, big retail business in the UK. And he is a uh, hired gun. He gets paid a bonus based on what he does to the business. And the owners of those two businesses are the same family called the Western family, and they don't really give away equity. But he said, you know, equity, schmeckity, I, I just want to get paid. You know? And if I do a really good job and I have to grow the business, then yes, a bonus is probably, you know, I think at the start of world equity may, you know, sounds good, but actually sometimes it's not the most appropriate tool to use. So I think it, it really depends. And actually equity future value is easier for, for younger people to swallow. Older people want, want the cash. So, do you know what I mean? So it's, it depends on the sort of age, age of it as well, age of the person that you want to talk about. Great, thank you. And also, equity is only worth something if you sell it. So, equity is only worth something if you're going to actually trade the business out or sell it. But if you're going to be a long-term hold and, and, and own, it for the, own it for the profits or for the, for the uh, operations, then, then that equity will never be realized. So, that's not an appropriate use for equity on that side. Exactly. Um, number two, you mentioned that you Each new co-working space definitely puts more capacity into the market. 
and that inevitably has an effect on us uh, somewhere down the line. And you're talking about copying what we do, we actually take pictures in some of the other co working spaces and the furniture is exactly the same. They don't have to take pictures of ours, gone out and made exactly the same. So that, that, you can't stop that happening, and that definitely does happen. The, the way we've tried to, to continue to be successful in this, in, in this sector is to be you know, the best, um, be smart about the locations that we choose, to have great, a great team that are really motivated. Um, we invest a lot in the fit out, actually, which, which other companies don't do. Um, we believe that design and fit out makes a really big difference to how people appreciate the space. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, I think we were terrified, or, or quietly, you know, we were very worried in the last couple of years what's going to happen to us with all of these spaces coming online. And actually, we're still full in Wan Chai, Kennedy Town is virtually full, Cyclone is filling up. So we've been able to grow even, if, even whilst all that competition's come on stream. So we're not. We're not cocky at all, but we're, we're, we're very pleased and relieved that we've been able to keep growing even though the competitive landscape's got so competitive, you know, even though it's got so, so crowded. Um, but now that's it for our locations in Hong Kong pretty well. Uh, we're now looking at opportunities where we see in other cities. Um, and we, we'll take the same philosophy there too. Well, thank you. Thanks very much everyone. Thank you.